Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 140, I chat with Yamaha Senior Vice President Tom Sumner about the company's 125-year history in audio, video, and many other types of products. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded December 10th, 2012. Episode 140. Happy 125th anniversary, Yamaha! This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek. On this week's episode, I have Tom Sumner, a senior vice president at Yamaha Corporation of America, which is celebrating its 125th anniversary. So we're going to be talking all about Yamaha today. Hey, Tom, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Scott. Nice to see you. Thanks. Nice to see you, too. Now, uh, is there an official date of, of the anniversary, or is it a month, or just this year? Or yeah, How are you calculating that? Uh, we calculated from the actual day we were founded, which was October 12th. So we started celebrating on October 12th, and we'll celebrate for a full year from October 12th. Cool. So we're sort of near the beginning of that celebration. Yeah, absolutely. We are just started it. Excellent. Um, I do want to mention to those who are watching live at live.twit.tv uh, or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Tom about Yamaha and its illustrious history and its products, many, many products. And uh, I'll pass along as many as I can. So uh, give us a little overview of the history of Yamaha as a company. Uh, how did it start? Was it Mr. Yamaha or Yamaha-san who started the uh, company 125 years ago? Yeah, absolutely. There was a real Mr. Yamaha, and he was a uh, watch repairman in Japan, and uh, as he was sort of traveling around Japan, repairing watches and clocks and things like that, uh, in Japan, you know, this is rural Japan in the 1800s, so people's entertainment was really their musical instruments, and they had lots of organs, uh, home organs there that people would play, and he found that a lot of them were actually broken. So in addition to repairing watches, he ended up repairing people's home organs as well, and he finally got tired of it and said, you know what? I can build a better product than this because it's important that these people have, you know, entertainment. And so uh, that's what he did. He started building uh, musical instruments, and our first product was actually a home organ that he built. And we've sort of grown over the years, and at this point, we're the largest musical instrument manufacturer in the world. We started off uh, a grand piano kind of early in the 1900s, which was a World's Fair grand piano, and we've grown and built many more instruments, including band instruments, and, uh, of course, technology products, too. So we've uh, gone into the home hi-fi business at the time. In 1969, it was the hi-fi business. It wasn't the home theater business. And we went into that. And also, so technology music products, so things like mixing boards that you would find at a Carnegie Hall or uh, on tour someplace, as well as um, synthesizer products and home recording products for home digital recording. So over the years, we've obviously added product categories and added other products that we've made. And so at this point, Yamaha actually sells about one out of every four musical instruments sold in the world. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, I have to tell you that as a musician myself, I own a number and play a number of Yamaha instruments, including my euphonium, which is a tenor tuba, <laughs> uh, and I know, I know. In fact, uh, my friend Jim Self, who is a world famous tuba player, played. Um, if you remember the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, mm -hmm. yep. The uh, the when the mothership finally shows up and and starts having a musical dialogue, yep. and and that big big bass sound that it makes in the ba 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 ba. That yep. is Jim Self playing tuba. <laughs> I don't know if he was playing a Yamaha at that time. 
But I do know that he plays a Yamaha now. And uh, so, you know, the brass instruments are extremely well regarded. Um, I also play Yamaha recorders, so the, the plastic recorders, which are inexpensive and yet they sound really good. So, yep. you know, for those for, for those moments when you don't need a expensive wooden recorder, the, the Yamaha does a great job. Um, iPad 05987 <laughs> <laughs> uh, says, asks, does Yamaha make a piano that can teach people to play kind of like gloves that would guide your fingers to the proper keys? Well, I don't think you do that. No, nope, uh, we don't. Have, but, not, sorry, an acoustic, not an acoustic piano, but we do have electronic keyboards that have guide lights uh, that actually teach you to play. So we have anywhere from, you know, $150 for an inexpensive portable keyboard to a, uh, you know, a Clavinova type keyboard, which is more expensive, uh, but obviously has better sound and that kind of stuff. But yeah, we do have those available. Mm -hmm. um, you, your PR company sent along several uh, photos, and I, I was hoping that one of them would be the, that very first organ, and I don't see it in the list, so we might not have had it. Do you remember the model number of that? Mm, you know, no, I don't. It's uh, okay. a long, yeah, long time ago, <laughs> before yeah, my time. Well, yeah, before your time, before my time even. Yep. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so Mr. Yamaha uh, was a watch repair man and ended up, was he a musician? He must have been, I guess, if he was going to make organs and such. He, uh, he had some musical ability. Not, I don't know if you'd call him a musician or not, but, you know, at that time in the world, uh, if you wanted to entertain yourself, you had to learn to play some sort of musical instrument, you know, and even in the U.S. at the time, you know, you had you know, bands of uh, mandolin players and things like that for entertainment because, you know, it was pre, certainly pre-TV, pre-radio, pre-almost everything. Yeah. Um, Beatmaster is asking about uh, the uh, uh, room simulation effects in your AV receivers. And he says, this may be a bit early in the show and we are going to get to that. He has, he has anticipated one of my questions that I definitely want to talk to you about. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, let's see. So musical instruments, um, professional audio equipment, which I covered in the pro audio realm when I was a journalist in that field, mm -hmm. uh, certainly mixers, uh, studio monitors, Here's here's an interesting product that I want to I want you to address the uh, Yamaha NS10. Oh yeah, uh, the the studio monitor. I think we do have a picture of that that I want to show you. I in fact have a pair of those. They're not right behind me at the moment, <laughs> but uh, they became very famous in the um, professional studio world. There they are. Yep. Oh yeah, I've they, got a. Pair they became of those. very. You got a pair of them yourself. I mean, almost I, every yeah. studio has a pair of these. Yeah, now, so this, what, what was so special about them? Why did, why did all the studios in the world end up with a pair of NS10s? So the um, engineer that first built these was one of those golden ear kind of guys that really understood sound. And he was trying to build a speaker that was very, very accurate and very inexpensive. And so if you look at those white cones, uh, that was a specific kind of tree that he found that would actually produce the tones as accurately as possible. And the reason that these were so, uh, you know, so ubiquitous, or even today, any picture you see of a recording studio has an NS10M in it. And the main reason is, is that you can mix on those, and you can be pretty well assured that if your mix sounds good on the NS10Ms, that it'll sound good in a, you know, a nice big stereo, in your home, it'll sound great in a movie theater. It'll sound great in a you know 1965 Dodge Dart coming over an AM radio. So, <laughs> it's kind of for anything. So, yeah. it's really I always amazing. I always heard that it, it was sort of a a, a great stand-in for uh, uh, typical home audio systems, which is yes, why it was it became so popular. Now, what about what about the issue? Do, do you remember this? That I remember in so many studios. A lot of them used to tape a piece of tissue over the tweeter. They did. Yeah, they did. So um, that was because the, tw the tweeters were a little harsh in the first ones. So we actually kind of joked about it uh, because we issued a new NS10 uh, that fixed that problem and actually covered the tweeter with something. So we said that the tweeters on the uh, newer ones were pre-toilet papered. So... <laughs> 
Uh, most of the new ones di didn't require uh, people to put tissue paper over the tweeters. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's good. I mean, I think I probably bought some of the first ones. When did they come out? Oh, boy. I, I don't even remember. <laughs> Long time ago. So they, they've been in recording studios since the 70s when I was in recording studios. So it's been a right. long time. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, I got mine probably in the mid 80s and, yep. uh, and have used them along with my Tannoys, uh, you know, to again check the mix for uh, typical home recordings or home playback systems. You know, not a lot of homes have Tannoy, uh, NFM8, you know, coaxial oh. driver, real expensive speakers. Uh, so these were a great way to to test. They were sort of the next step beyond the Oratone. You remember the mm -hmm. Oratone? Oh, yeah. Yep. Tiny little cube speakers that were meant to sort of simulate, you know, little boom boxes and cheapy uh, transistor radios and such. And the, the NS10s were kind of the next step of, of, of that kind of idea. Yep. So... Uh, <clears throat> So it, it, so we've covered a little bit of the pro audio. We've covered a little bit of the musical instruments. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and one, one other musical instrument I do want to mention, which was so important, uh, was the DX7. Oh, yeah. This was, this was a, a uh, synthesizer that used, at the time, a relatively new type of synthesis called frequency modulation. Yep, and uh, I, I think we might have a picture of that. Depends on when uh, John downloaded those files. There it is. Uh, I of course had a DX7. I think uh, again, almost everybody who was into making music and electronic music in particular had a DX7. How did the DX7 come about? I know it was based on frequency modulation, which had been developed by uh, John uh, Chowning. Yeah, Chowning at yeah. Stanford. Yeah. Oh yeah. So how how did that become a commercial product then? Yeah, so our uh, engineers actually, uh, you know, worked with the Stanford folks uh, on that product, and we saw uh, the ability of that to create a product um, that could create amazing sounds at a reasonable price. So, you know, at the time that the DX7 came out, there were some synthesizers out, not very accurate and definitely nothing like what we have today with a motif or something. But they were all kind of, you know, you would be spending $5,000, $6,000, $10,000 on a synthesizer. And with the DX7, one of the, there were a couple of key things. One was that it sounded great, and it actually saved people's backs from going out. Because before the DX7, they used to have to carry around a Fender Rhodes, which weighed uh, about a ton. <laughs> to right. bring in a gigs right. all the time. I was and, in a few rock bands myself where we were hauling around uh, uh, Fender Rhodes and B3 organs with the Leslie speaker. And that was, talk about a backbreaker. Holy smokes. Oh, yeah. So the, the, uh, the product sounded great, and it was selling for around $2,000 at the time, which was, you know, an unbelievable price. And uh, people lined up to buy them. And, you know, from 80s records... Almost every record in the 80s seemed to have a DX7 on it someplace, whether it was the Bell sounds or the Rhodes sound, uh, really ubiquitous from the 80s. I mean, if you, uh, if you took the DX7 out of the 80s, there'd be almost no music in the 80s, I think. <laughs> I believe that's true. We got several people in the chat room saying, uh, I remember the DX7. I lusted after it as a kid. I still have a, T I still have a TX7 in the rack. Now, what was interesting about the synthesizers in those days, and even t today, well, less so today, but you had a keyboard version and then you had a rack version. And uh, the uh, TX-816 actually yep. allowed you to place up to eight DX-7s in a rack, in a little rack space uh, card cage, essentially, or, or um, backplane. Yep. And uh, boy, that was that was really something. I had a I had I had one of those with two DX a TX seven modules in it. I I never did manage to get get around to filling it up, but uh, and I remember using the harp sound, especially that harp sound that the DX seven made was wonderful. Yep, great sounds. Yeah. Well. Uh, enough reminiscing about all the musical stuff because uh, I could talk about that all day. But this is, after all, home theater geeks. So let's uh, talk a little bit about home theater. Um, and uh, what was Yamaha's first entree into, let's say, home audio video? Well, so home audio went way back to 1969. It was kind of interesting because... Um, we were a musical instrument company, so some people say, well, how did you get into... Well, usually people ask us how we got into motorcycles, but, you know, how did you get into home audio? <laughs> and, 
And the way we got into home audio is kind of interesting. So engineers are kind of interesting folks. They tend to work whatever hours they want. So they might show up at uh, noon, but then they'll work until midnight, right? So Sounds very familiar to me. I mean, that's how I work. <laughs> <laughs> so in Japan, uh, our engineers, as sort of a hobby in the late 60s, were building their own hi-fi systems and putting them at their workbenches where they were working. And the president of Yamaha at the time uh, used to like to go through and visit all the engineers, and he saw all of these... Uh, you know, sort of home hi-fi things that they had built from turntables to amplifiers uh, to tuners. And uh, they all sort of had this contest of who could build the best one. And so that's actually how we got into the business because all these guys had a passion for music, really musical instruments, and they wanted to reproduce it as best they could. So they um, were building their own, and that really led us to put out our first products, which, you know, turntable and uh, integrated amps, you know, way back in 1969. And uh, as we went further into the future with home theater products, um, our AV receivers, and those have obviously changed quite a bit over the years, but I think one of the first key things that was really important was the DSP that you were talking about earlier. And really starting from our own pro audio experience, you know, we knew that the experience that you get, you know, seeing a show at the Budokan in uh, Japan versus what you get at the bottom line in New York City, it's a totally different experience and a totally different sound. And yet when you were playing it back at home, whether it was a uh, probably at the time a laser disc uh, uh, experience, <laughs> yeah. um, you, know, you were getting the same thing. You were getting the sound of your own home. So our engineers decided that it would be kind of cool to go out and actually measure different venues. So measure the Budokan. So if you wanted to listen back to Cheap Trick playing at Budokan, you could put on the Budokan setting on DSP and actually experience it like that. Or if you wanted to experience, you know, Mingus at the bottom line in New York, you could uh, actually put on that DSP setting. And there was some kind of interesting stuff early on where we actually did all the measurements and we, you know, put in the DSP and uh, wrote the algorithms for the DSP. And we actually went to recording engineers and we played it back to them and said, so tell us what you think, you know, where you think this is. And I actually remember one engineer that was listening to it and he listened uh, very carefully and said, uh, you know, I'm really not sure exactly where that is, but the room has, it's a small room, it has brick walls, and it has a low ceiling, you know, maybe, you know, nine feet somewhere in there, and it's sort of a long and uh, narrow room. And so he had described a jazz club in New York perfectly, so he didn't know which club it was, but he knew what the room was like. So the measurements actually became really accurate, and, you know, that was really kind of the beginning of, uh, you know, Yamaha really being really successful in home theater. Now, was the Yamaha was among the first to actually do that, go out and measure particular halls for their acoustic characteristics and then reproduce that in their receivers. It's now ubiquitous. I mean, every receiver has, most virtually all receivers anyway, have these simulations, these acoustical simulations of, of spaces. Was Yamaha the, the first to do that? Yeah, we were the very first ones to do that. And it really came out of our you know, understanding of concert halls and understanding of the acoustic experience you know, really from our pro audio and commercial audio uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. um, now, I've always wondered this. When, when considering these simulations, uh, like Budokan or the, the, the what, what, which was the New York club you mentioned? I was talking the bottom line is, I think, what I oh, said. Oh, the bottom line, yeah. Yep. I've actually played at another one called The Bitter End in the village. Oh, so yeah. that's the one I always think of. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> When, you're, you, when, you're, when you select one of these modes that is supposed to simulate the sound of the concert hall or the venue, you're adding that, though, to the sound of the consumer's room, the actual room that the speakers are in and so on. Uh, do, have, have the Yamaha engineers taken that into account? Obviously, they can't take into account different rooms, but uh, how do they take that into account or do they just sort of not worry about it? Well, actually... You know, obviously, as you know, the room is super important, and you know, most of your listeners know that the room is super important to the overall experience. So, actually, we do a uh, we have what 
we call WIPOW, which is a room optimization. Uh, so if the customer actually runs WIPOW, uh, you know, it'll, it knows where your speakers are, it makes sure that your speakers are in phase, uh, understands where the room is and sort of optimizes the room. And the, uh, if you do that, and unfortunately not all customers do that, but you should, <laughs> it includes mm -hmm. a little microphone, phone so you can set up the room uh, right away when you install your receiver. But if you do that, then you're going to get a pretty accurate reading of you know, whatever club it is. Hmm. That's a good point. Uh, certainly, I, do, I usually recommend using YPAL, Yamaha Parametric Acoustic Optimization. Is that what it stands for? Yep, that's it. YP, yep. YPAO. Uh, or one of the others in, in some of the other receivers uh, because it does tend to optimize the sound for that room. Some people prefer to do it manually, and that's fine. Uh, some people find that they prefer the un processed sound to the corrected sound and that's fine too but uh i do encourage people to play around with it anyway yeah, it's um, a good starting point good start it's a good point. yeah exactly and then you can tweak it from there yeah exactly right now uh swamp rat in the chat room said uh, that a few years ago he bought a surround receiver which died three months after the warranty expired oh. uh, <clears throat> i'm sorry to sorry to hear that um i have to say that i still have a yamaha r7 stereo receiver that still works and that's <laughs> at least 30 40 years old so it was my very first stereo receiver as a matter of fact so um i think we we can say pretty pretty safely that everybody all companies are going to have a situation sometimes where occasionally a product is going to fail uh and soon after the warranty ends um but that does not that's that's only anecdotal that's one example you can't really um globalize to say well you know all yamaha products are junk because of that or any other company where you happen to have that experience um and i'm sure uh, tell you know yes yamaha customer service uh we all have trouble with customer service now and again how does yamaha handle it uh, we've got uh, we spend a lot of time on customer support so we have actually 24 by 7 customer support right here in the United States. So, uh, I mean, if you know, I call, if I call Yamaha at two in the customer service at two in the morning, I'm going to get a real person in the U S you will get a real person in the U S I, I sort of kid that you won't get somebody with a, you know, a foreign accent, but, uh, the customer support is actually in, uh, well, we're in Southern California and the 24 by seven customer support is in Laguna Hills, California. So I always kid that you might get a surfer accent, dude, but other than that, <laughs> you know, you'll be able to understand them as long as you speak Californian. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so Swamp Rat, I'm sorry you had that experience, but uh, I, I wouldn't let it sour you on, on Yamaha products. And I'm not trying to be a Yamaha spokesperson here. I happen to have to, to own a number of Yamaha products. Uh, that that it worked very well. So uh, it's not something I don't think you can generalize with any company, really, uh, it, unless you have a lot of reports of that. Um, we, there was a question here about the NS10 uh, before we get too far away from it. Uh, oh, uh, Dr. T is asking, what is the equivalent model of the NS10 today? Does Yamaha make something or is the NS10 still being made? So, no, the NS10 is not being made any longer. So I mentioned that engineer who actually designed the NS10M and those trees that he actually got that cone material from uh, ceased to be available to us anymore. So instead of, you know, continuing to make those and they wouldn't have sounded the same, so we actually stopped making them. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is that market has changed completely because now people, they don't want the passive speakers like the NS10Ms were, what they want is a powered speaker. And actually, from our perspective, that makes it a little easier because you can ha design the amplifier within the enclosure, and then you can control all the damping factor and everything else much, much, much more accurately than you could before. So um, we make a product called the HS50Ms, which are uh, designed to be kind of a mimic of the NS10Ms, except they are powered. And that's really what people want today. I think uh, for monitor speakers, uh, I might, might have the numbers not exactly right, but I think it's about 20 to 1 powered over passive monitor speakers uh, at this point. When it, when it comes to home studios, you mean? When it comes to home studios. I mean, to recording studios. Yep, recording studios, yep. Right. Uh, what about in the home, though, in the home theater situation or the home uh, uh, listening room situation? Do you sell many powered speakers into that environment? 
Only subwoofers, really. Obviously, powered subs mm -hmm. work really well, but in general, sure. yeah, in general, it's passive speakers and then a, uh, you know, a, a receiver to power the speakers. <clears throat> right, of course, of course. Yeah. Um, I wonder, though, why it is that powered speakers haven't made a bigger impact in the home environment. Because as you said, and I agree with this completely, when the manufacturer is able to pair an amplifier with a speaker and build it into the enclosure, you can optimize so many things that you have no idea what's going to happen if you put a receiver in there and then you don't know what, what speakers the customer has. Um, and yet, you know, you, the receiver certainly is a, is a model, a paradigm, I should say, that, that has been very ubiquitous uh, all this time. Um, but do you have any sense of, of why powered speakers haven't made a bigger impact on the home market? No, that, that's a good question. Uh, I would think that a couple of things are some in, in some of the home installations, you have at least, you know, kind of your surrounds and sometimes even your mains that are built into the walls, which is a little different, I guess, depending on whether it's professionally installed or semi-professionally installed. Um, but uh, that might be the reason why. And obviously, things like YPOW help with that, but it doesn't control everything. You can't control all of the variables that you have with speaker design, which is, you know, there are a lot of things to think about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Luis in the chat room is saying the uh, Yamaha DSP A1 was and is his favorite home audio receiver. And I wow. do know a number of people who have, have a DSP A1. Now, that was, uh, what, in the 80s or so? I, I think that's right. Yeah, that was one of the first ones with DSP. And we have we have one of those sitting in our museum in Hamamatsu, Japan. But I think that's the only one I've actually ever seen. <laughs> right, right. I have a friend actually who who still owns and uses his. So there's another example of, of longevity. Yep. Uh certainly. Uh yep. well let's see. Uh <clears throat> before we go on, and I got a couple questions in here about sound bars, and I want to get to sound bars. And, and talk about those, because Yamaha's been a very important player in that category as well. But before we do, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Netflix. Now, Netflix, as most of you already know, uh, lets you stream thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to just about any consumer electronics device that you might have, including your computer, of course, uh, your TV, uh, your Blu-ray player, your Roku or other set-top box, uh, game console, uh, even smartphones and tablets all have Netflix apps, which let you stream as much of this content that they offer as you want. And believe me, it's a lot of content, all for one low monthly fee. You can even start on one device and finish on another. So it offers you really the ultimate inconvenience as well as access to all that content. Now, for Twit listeners, those few of you who might not have already tried Netflix, there is a special offer, 30-day free trial. Just go to netflix.com slash twit and give it a try. I bet you'll get hooked in a hustle and a hurry. That's netflix.com slash twit. And we thank Netflix very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks and the entire Twit Network. So, Tom, uh, let us talk about sound bars because right. that is a category that Yamaha uh, got into pretty early. I remember the first one. I don't remember the model number, but I remember hearing it at, uh, it was probably Cedia. It might have been CES quite a few years ago. Yep. And I remember being astonished, actually, at how well this one bar-shaped device with some speaker drivers in it simulated the effect of surround sound. I could hear sounds coming at me from the side, certainly, if not the back. And as I recall, it did rely on reflections. And it was being demonstrated in a sort of a room within a room where there were side walls. So yeah. I think that was the first approach to simulating surround from a sound bar, right? Yeah, and I don't think uh, you were alone in having your jaw drop when you heard that demonstration. There were actually people, I remember that CES show... Uh, when that YSP-1 first came out, and there were people actually looking for speakers built into those back walls. They, right. uh, they, they were sure that that had happened. 
And I guess, you know, what I would say is that it's, you know, it's really not simulated surround because you're using multiple drivers. You, know, you could be using, you know, 32, 48 drivers, uh, each with their own digitally controlled amplifier. And so it allows you to actually, uh, you're right, you need reflections for uh, the YSP for the sound projector. Um, but it's actually, you're getting sound from behind you. It's not like you're getting tricked with an, you know, head-related transfer function. Uh, you're actually getting sound from behind you. So right. It's, so it's, it's unfair to call it simulated surround because it is actual surround. It just is surround. sound coming from the front, being reflected off the walls. How do you right. prevent the sound that is intended to go to be reflected off the walls and be the surround channels from also reaching your ears directly? Because after all, sound emanates and comes out of a speaker in a more or less spherical pattern. Yeah, so it's um, so there are a couple of things. One of the main things is is that the setup again on a sound projector is critical, and we have a setup mode on all of our sound projectors. So it will, uh, you know, it looks at each individual driver and it looks at where the reflective surfaces are. So it will actually, you know, target those beams, you know, to a reflected surface. And some of them are coming probably directly to you, like a you know, a center channel type speaker would be coming directly at you. Uh, sure, but it, of course. So, yeah, so it actually um, measures the room and finds the reflective surfaces and finds, you know, sort of the sweet spot where you're sitting to make sure you get the appropriate reflections. Uh, this actually, uh, there's a related question in the chat room that, that's kind of related to this, but I'll ask you to comment on it. iPad 05987 asks, why does music sound terrible outdoors? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Great question as it relates to what we're talking about, actually. And it's, it's physics. <laughs> it's <laughs> physics. So, you know how you can be, um, you know, miles and miles away from a concert venue and you're still hearing things like bass, right? So right. It's, it's really, you can't control the environment outdoors. And uh, or it's very difficult to control the environment outdoors, which is why they build things like amphitheaters to try to keep some of the sound in and allow you to control the sound a lot better. Uh, but indoors, you can control the sound very well. Uh, outdoors, you know, you have the problem with uh, wavelengths where, you know, bass wavelengths, super, super long. They carry forever and ever and ever. And those high uh, and, and not very directional either. So they carry everywhere. And then you have higher frequencies, uh, which are very, very, you know, narrow uh, bandwidth. And they don't, they carry, but they don't, they're very directional. So, uh, you know, sound outdoors is really tough. Although I got to say that, you know, recently in you know, the last couple of summers that I've been, you know, to concerts outdoors, they've done a really, really good job of making the outdoors sound great. Really impressive stuff that they can do with, um, you know, with phasing and all sorts of things outdoors now. But in general, he's right. It's tough to make outdoors sound good. Now, do you, in amongst your DSP modes, have the engineers ever gone and measured an amphitheater, an outdoor venue, and, and put that in the receivers? You know, I don't know. I can't think of an outdoor venue. Uh, there are very few... Um, the only outdoor venue I can think of where people say, wow, that's great sound is Red Rocks out of, outside of Denver. Uh, yep. But other than that, most venues that people talk about and say, wow, this like a Carnegie Hall or something like that, where they say the sound is great. It's usually an indoor venue where they can control the acoustics a mm -hmm. lot. Better. Exactly. Have your, has uh, Yamaha engineers ever uh, measured Disney Hall in L.A.? It's relatively new. Uh, but it's a really beautiful sounding hall for orchestras. I've been there many times, and uh, I think that might be a really nice one to to add to the collection. Yeah, that would be a good one to add to the collection. It's it's a great sounding hall for classical music, no doubt about that. Um, <clears throat> iPhone Kiki in the chat room is asking: Are there any new Yamaha soundbars with these room modes coming out? Have, have Yamaha soundbars ever had the uh, the room simulators in them? Uh, not really. We have, we will have some new products, uh, that we'll be releasing shortly, uh, for higher end, uh, sound bars. Uh, not out yet, but we will have some coming out shortly. Um, maybe, maybe we'll see them at CES, huh? Yes, absolutely. Be seen at CES. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So we've talked about the sound bars, the sound projectors, I should say, as Yamaha calls them. 
uh, in which the surround channels are actually produced by their own speaker drivers and aimed and beamed off to the sidewalls, and that re- they depend upon sidewalls reflecting that sound mm-hmm. back around to your ears uh, from the sides to create that surround effect. Yamaha has since also gotten into the other way to provide a surround sound field, which is, as you mentioned earlier, simulated, truly simulated with head-related transfer functions and phase differences and so on. Yeah. Um, how, how, when did Yamaha get into that and, and how has that progressed? Yeah, we created our own uh, algorithm basically for creating you know, the fake surround or simulated surround. It's called Air Surround Extreme. It works pretty well. Um, we, uh, you know, obviously it's not the same as a sound projector. The sound projector gives, gives you the true 7.1 surround. This gives you kind of a, you know, simulated 7.1 surround. Uh, a couple of benefits are, uh, the main benefit is price. Uh, if you look at a YSP, a true sound projector, you really need to have multiple drivers and multiple amplifiers. And usually you're looking at 32 drivers, 16 drivers, and 16 separate amps. So it's really expensive to do that. And we've been able to, with the Air Surround Extreme, actually create a pretty good effect with really just kind of an LCR type setup with an integral subwoofer. So, you know, a left center and right speaker. So three speakers and then an integrated subwoofer. And Mm -hmm. really what you get there is, you know, it's really a price factor where if depending on what you want to use it for. So we see a lot of people using sound bars in places where they might not want to spend a lot of money. So it might be a a man cave where you're playing video games or a kid's TV room or a bedroom or a guest room. We're seeing people put the sound bars in there with the Air Surround Extreme. And then on the other side of things, where we look at the... Um, YSP product or the sound projector product, where we're seeing people put those in is places, you know, maybe they can't actually do it. So they've got a uh, vacation home maybe that has, you know, river rock or poured concrete or something like that where, you know, putting in speakers around the room would be basically impossible. So a sound projector works well in some of those areas. And we're also seeing more of the sound projectors actually go into main rooms, mostly because of uh, what we call the WAF or the wife acceptance factor. Yes, we've talked about that many times on this show. So that's basically the, um, you know, you've got a main room and we're kind of going away a lot of, in a lot of respects from the, you know, home theater and we have a nice video set up in the main room. But if it's in the main room, you know, we're also having conversations there and the whole family is there. So the sound projector makes a good choice there. So you still get the full effect of sporting events. You can feel like you're right in the middle of the football game. You still get the full concert experience. You still get the full video game experience, the full DVD or Blu-ray experience. But it also looks good and it's not, you don't have to drill into the walls and do all that kind of stuff. Right. I think we have a picture of the uh, YAS201 uh, soundbar, which uh, is that one of the, is that a uh, projector, sound projector, or one of these uh, surround simulator things? It's a surround simulator. It's a brand new one that's uh, a one bar with a wireless subwoofer. So that's a brand, brand new product. Whoa. <laughs> oh, that doesn't look like it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. um, yeah, it was in the in the file, John, uh, called 2012 products. So uh, that that was a little bit of a of an organizational thing there. Sorry to throw that at you right at the last minute. Um, while he's looking for that, let me ask you about the receivers. Uh, you have now a whole line of receivers called a vintage. It's How'd you come Aven- up with that name? By uh, Adventage. Aventage. Aventage. Sorry, Aventage. Aventage. How did you come up with that name? Well, coming up with uh, series names is really difficult at this point. So you have to come up almost with a word that isn't a real word. So Aventage sort of looks like a French word, but it's not. And so we kind of started throwing things together. And it's if you look at it, it's AV Entertainment for the New Age. That's how we came up with Aventage. It actually means something. It actually means something. <laughs> 
unlike Exxon, which I think uh, the the gas company came up with or the gasoline company came up with because they wanted to find a word that didn't mean anything in any language. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, now there are a couple questions I have uh, about the receivers, uh, which and one of them came actually from a reader uh, who sent me an email. It, well, this is not from the chat room, but that reader was complaining that so in so many cases these days in AV receivers, the legacy inputs of component video, S video, composite video, even for you know VCRs mm -hmm. uh, and so on, are disappearing, and only HDMI is is remaining. And they mentioned Yamaha high end receivers in particular as being one of the few left that will convert the older legacy signals into HDMI and send that to the receiver. Is that something that Yamaha consciously wanted to maintain? And is it only available in the high-end models? Well, it's, um, it's kind of tough because there are all sorts of things. I mean, you mentioned S-Video, and I, I don't know anybody. I, we pulled S-Video off of almost everything. I don't know anybody that has S-Video left on anything. So I haven't seen it in a while, that's for sure. Yeah, it's been a while. So one of the th interesting things when you talk about component, and there are a lot of receivers that have completely pulled component off, but uh, we still have a lot of installers, professional uh, AV installers, that really still rely on component. They're they're still not into this newfangled HDMI stuff. Uh, truthfully, <laughs> truthfully, there are a lot of instances where it makes a lot more sense to run component than HDMI for them. So uh, we've tried to make sure we keep that on there. And there's, there's still a lot of places where component makes sense. It seems to be, you know, nothing, the consumer never upgrades everything at the same time. So it's not like most consumers go out and buy, you know, a new Blu-ray, a new receiver, and a new uh, panel all at the same time. And then also, in the U.S. anyway, end up getting a new set-top box at the same time. It just doesn't happen all that often. So mm -hmm. there's, al there's always some lag. So you might have... Um, you know, one piece that has HDMI and other pieces that don't. And also consumers, you know, with Yamaha receivers, fortunately, they tend to last a while. So they also tend to migrate. So, you know, three or four years ago, they might have been the top of the line Yamaha receiver, uh, but it gets migrated to the den or someplace else. And then a new receiver comes in in the main TV viewing room. So, you know, keeping the component connections and the appropriate upscaling and uh, conversion is, is, is important to us. And it just kind of depends on the price point of the receiver, whether it's doing that or not. Some of the lower end pieces, uh, you know, won't, won't component to HDMI at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, Lawn Dog in the chat room is asking, uh, what things are coming in the next amplifier? And I assume he means, um, a receiver series, like new types, new codecs, um, new types of Dolby Pro Logic uh, 2Z, for example, um, surround sound updates uh, that are coming out that, that we haven't seen yet in Yamaha receivers. I don't think Yamaha does any uh, Odyssey uh, processing, do you? No. Uh, Odyssey, basically, we use our own YPOW system as opposed to well, using... Well, right, Odyssey. right. Yeah. For, in terms of room correction, yes. But then there, I, Odyssey also has... Uh, dynamic volume, dynamic EQ, uh, right. that sort of thing. Um, we, we tend to grow our own on that stuff. So we have uh, things like unit volume and that kind of stuff that, that sort of take the place of that. Mm -hmm. And we, we basically do all our own firmware programming. And so it kind of makes sense uh, to continue to do that, especially when we're using our own room correction and that kind of stuff. So we, we tend to grow our own on those as opposed to buy something off the shelf. Gotcha. Uh, Lawn Dog goes on to say, it seems like it isn't long after I purchase an amplifier when there's a new decoder needed, like THX or Dolby Digital or something like that. But that's always going to be the case, isn't it? Yeah, there's always going to be something new coming down the pike, it seems like. So, uh, you know, you kind of have to pitch in at some point and, and get the receiver, I guess. But uh, there's always going to be something new. Yeah, see, I agree with that. I, I think if you wait for the next big thing, you're never going to get anything. And so you might as well get what, what you know you need and want now and can afford, of course, right. uh, <clears throat> and then just use it and enjoy it. And then when it's time to upgrade, you, there'll be the next set of things. 
Yeah, and um, there's always there's there's always a lag time too. So I mean, if if you look at things like the perfect example right now is uh, 4K or Ultra HD, right? So right. you know that's coming down the pike, right? So do you want to wait for that or wait for the panels to come? You know, I what are they twenty twenty thousand dollars or something like that now? So maybe the, the LG is twenty thousand, the Sony's twenty five, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not buying one for Christmas. I'll tell you that. So, <laughs> but uh, you know, do you wait for that? And it, there's some adoption time where you know, is there really going to be 4K material out there that you're going to enjoy right away? Kind of like 3D, right. we experience the same thing. Right. Exactly. Uh, Dcas seven 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 in the chat room is asking if you think Dolby Atmos will take off in home home receivers anytime soon. Do you, are you familiar with Dolby Atmos? Are you not? Um, I don't think we have that implemented at this point. No, so no, I, nobody, nobody does in the home. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a commercial cinema format where a sound format where you have speakers all around you and overhead. And yeah, there so aren't it, very many theaters, even in the, even in the United States that even have it yet. But, uh, of course I also wonder as DCAST 777 does, you know, whether that will eventually come to the home. It's another one of those examples you were just talking about. Of a, of a technology that's going to take a while to migrate into the home. Yeah. And like, for, like 4K. Like 4K. And consumers, you know, we've already seen this with home theater systems. If a consumer has a 5.1 system set up, they've got a nice system. Not too many people put in 7.1 systems. And we, you know, we actually have up to 11.2 systems. I don't know... I don't personally know anyone that has an 11.2 system in their house. <laughs> so most consumers don't really like multiple, multiple speakers around the room, even if they have a dedicated home theater room, unless they've got a dedicated home theater room with all of the nice, you know, uh, acoustic paneling and the, that kind of stuff where they actually have the speakers hidden behind screens and things like that. Right, right, exactly. Um, Lawn Dog, here's another question. He asks you to describe what, quote, the Yamaha sound is. Every amplifier has a tone or a char tonal characteristic that Yamaha is trying to achieve. And I know Yamaha has referred to something called natural sound. Right. We've, we've used the term natural sound on our receivers for quite a while. And I think the, uh, we try to have a really accurate sound. And the, uh, yeah, it's hard to explain, you know, what that what that means, but you yeah. know, really accurate sound. Some some uh, you know some receivers say, oh, we have kind of a warm sound. So ours would tend to be probably more bright than warm because that's it's a little more accurate. Right, understood. Um, iPad O five nine eighty seven is asking, what's that instrument on on the wall behind you? Ah, that's a silent guitar. So a silent guitar, a just what I always wanted. Guitar. It's it's not quite as good as a silent bagpipe, but it's awfully. <laughs> <laughs> so the well, silent. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know the old joke, you know, about how to get a guitar player to turn down, right? Uh, yeah, put sheet music in front of them, right? Precisely. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a guitar player, so I know that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you know that one. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. So tell us about the silent guitar. Uh, silent Guitar is a product that uh, we made for, we actually made a whole series of silent instruments and still do, uh, including silent violins and actually we have uh, silent uh, brass systems like silent trumpet. But uh, the Silent Guitar was really kind of meant to uh, be a travel guitar. So, you know, it's kind of hard to tell, but the upper bout, which is the top part of that, actually comes off. So it fits in a uh, case and a, that you can carry on to an airplane or whatever that's really small. And it feels just like a guitar and it kind of responds like it because even though that uh, upper bout kind of looks like it might be made of plastic or some sort of composite, it's actually made of wood. So the whole guitar actually resonates. And we have one in a steel string version and in a nylon string version. Hmm. So it lets, it lets you take it with you, practice Get, get, keep your chops up, as it were. Yep. Yeah, it, uh, it, it can be used for that. Uh, some people actually also use them on stage. We've actually had, uh, because there's no, uh, so one of the problems you end up with on stage with guitars, especially acoustic guitars, is feedback. And uh, with this, there's no feedback whatsoever. So we, there have been, uh, so like Lee Rittenauer uses one, and uh, Queen actually uses them live as well. So Brian May from Queen. Hmm. 
Uh, iPhone Kiki is asking, any new Yamaha receivers with 3D sound coming out? Uh, well, we have uh, 3D, video 3D, obviously, 3D up, uh, 3D on almost everything, uh, on almost every single one of our receivers. I'm not sure uh, what 3D sound means. Yeah, uh, exactly. Certainly, yeah. You, do, you do have 3D uh, pass-through uh, of 3D uh, video signals. Somebody asked about HDMI pass through from your sound bars. I'm trying to find that. But one of the things that I really like about uh, at least some of the Yamaha sound, sound bars, you can tell me if, if this is true of all of them or not, um, <clears throat> they actually have an IR remote uh, blaster on the back so that if you put the sound bar in front of a TV and it's blocking the TV's IR receiver for its remote, uh, the Yamaha sound bar will take that IR signal and retransmit it from the back of the soundbar to the TV's IR receiver. And I think that's a brilliant idea. Yeah, it it really helps. And again, this is a great, you know, WAF, a wife acceptance factor because you know, it really eliminates the need for, well, I need to grab my soundbar remote and I need to grab my TV remote and I need to grab my cable remote. You can really just, you know, use um, you can really just use the remote uh, from your cable box or from your TV. Um, and it'll go right through the uh, the soundbar. Actually, learns you know the uh, key things, you know, so the volume up and down and on off that kind of stuff. Right, and, right. And I uh, I have always wished that other manufacturers would take uh you know take a lesson from Yamaha in this regard, uh, because it's, it seems so obvious, and yet few other soundbar manufacturers do it. Yep, that's true. Um, <clears throat> getting a couple of questions here about upgradability. Uh, firmware updates. Does Yamaha typically offer firmware updates to its receivers in particular uh, that, maybe, that maybe add new features or uh, new surround codecs as they become available, that sort of thing? Is that something Yamaha does routinely? Uh, we routinely offer firmware updates. It's not all the time. It's really just for new features. And you know, we actually just offered one recently where uh, on our Example, our RXV673 on up, which is about a $600-ish receiver on up. Uh, we added streaming services that weren't available. So like Pandora and SiriusXM online, uh, those kind of things uh, to the receivers, which wasn't previously available on those receivers. So mm -hmm. we do that kind of stuff for firmware. Uh, Lawn Dog's asking a lot of questions here today. And uh, one of them is, are your top-of-the-line amplifiers Class A or Class AB? Or I would add Class D, perhaps. Yeah, not not Class D. Class. Uh, eh. I'd have to go back and look at what what pieces we've got in there because we the surrounds are different than the mains. So mm. I'd have to go back and look. Right. So you're not doing much with Class D amps at this point, right? No. No. Other than perhaps your powered subwoofers, because those typically use Class D these days yeah. anyway for the oh, efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, okay. In the last few minutes, uh, I want to talk about, uh, you've gotten more recently, the probably the most recent product category that Yamaha has gotten into over its 125-year history with regard to AV is headphones. Would you agree? Is that a fair statement? Yes. Yeah. Brand new uh, category for us is, is headphones. And how did, you, how, did, how did you come to start into that product category? Well, you know, headphones is kind of a hot product category right now. People are selling a lot of headphones. And, you know, we looked at it and we said, gee, we've always had headphones really for the pro audio applications, you know, where people are, uh, you know, checking sounds from the stage uh, through the main board or checking monitor mixes. Uh, so we've done that for a long time. But the requirements for those kind of headphones are a lot different. So with those headphones, you really need headphones that take a lot of level and are pretty accurate and, uh, you know, pretty much are very isolating. So not really exactly what you need for the modern lifestyle where you're listening to music, you're watching videos, and maybe even playing games on digital, you know, on cell phones or on iPads, tablets, that kind of stuff. So what we did is we kind of looked at the market and we said, you know, what's going on and uh, where do we fit in or do we fit in? And one of the things we noticed was that um, most of the headphones in the market were really designed for 
sort of electronic dance music or hip hop, uh, urban music. And so they had a really pronounced bass in almost all of them. And so you kind of had a choice. You either could spend, you know, if you're spending a good amount on a headphone, you were still getting a very pronounced bass and sort of a fashion look, or you were getting um, really kind of a conservative uh, look. So uh, we said, gee, we can do better than that. We can make headphones that sound good kind of for all music. And when you really look at what people listen to, it's still over half of what people are listening to is actually sort of some variety of rock, whether it's classic rock or alternative. Uh, they're listening to some version of that. And even things like classical music that is, you know, from a sales standpoint, maybe sells, you know, one half of 1% of all the music in the country. And if you look at what people listen to, it's still about 10 to 12% of what people report they listen to is classical music. So making headphones that sound good for all of those things is important and that they work well with the smartphones and work well with tablets. So we spent a lot of time designing the headphones to sound good and to look good. And we, and we have a picture, by the way, of the um, Pro 500 headphones, which uh, was also in the 2012 products folder. We'll see if we can get that up. Perfect. Meanwhile, oh. Londog asked the question, um, <laughs> What, uh, will your will your um, receivers send the surround information to the headphones? Is there some sort of surround simulation that can be used in headphones from the receiver? Yes, the, uh, there is. Basically, all of our receivers have the, uh, through the headphone jack, have what's called the silent cinema, which gives you that kind of surround information or surround uh, through the headphones. Mm -hmm. Um. And Rusty Bones is asking uh, about hype channels. Do you implement? Um, I know I, I'm pretty sure Yamaha was one of the first to implement front height channels in yeah. AV receivers. Yeah, obviously we do that a couple of different ways. But uh, again, people don't like speakers so much. So yes, we have that in our you know 9.2 and 11.2 receivers. But what's better is that we have a simulated height channel. So we have sort of a phantom speaker. You know, we build a phantom speaker out of your center plus your two front, uh, front right and left. Uh, so we can build that phantom channel, uh, phantom height speaker. Mm -hmm. That's what most people use because it's really, again, 5.1, even if, if people have 5.1 implemented, that's great. Most don't. So the <laughs> phantom don't even, don't even have that much. Yeah. Um, they, yeah. Much less 7.1 or... Oh, look at this. Luisa in the chat room is saying the DSP A1 had two height channels wow. in, in front. So that... And that's some time ago. I, I, th I don't recall if we said when that was, but it's probably at least 20, 30 years ago. Yep. Yep. Quite a ways. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, <clears throat> now, the, uh, the last point I want to bring up with you, because we are coming to the end of the show, um, but I know that you and I, when we were talking offline before the show... Uh, you mentioned that one of your uh, crusades in the industry, shall we say, is the importance of demoing audio video gear in a retail environment. Now, as we all know, most people are going online to buy their equipment and the retail brick and mortar environment is kind of disappearing. So my, my response to your assertion that it's important to go hear products and see them too before you buy. And I agree with that, but it's becoming more and more difficult, certainly to see TVs and so on, because, you know, you're in a brightly lit room and they're all adjusted to be as bright and blue as possible. Um, but when it comes to audio equipment, uh, there's, I think there are fewer and fewer places where you can go and actually, and actually hear products. How, how do you, reconcile the importance, which I agree with, of hearing these products before you buy them with the marketing trend now of buying everything online. Yeah, it's, that's hard to reconcile. And still about you know, roughly around 70% of the you know, home theater products are actually bought in a brick and mortar store as opposed to being bought online. So there's definitely a trend towards online, but it's not all done online. And I, I think for me, the important thing is that what people really respond to, they have an emotional response to home theater products, right? We have an emotional response to sound, to music, uh, to movies. 
And so to really understand that and to get the feeling of, well, why do I want a, uh, you know, a 5.1 res- receiver versus a 7.1 receiver versus different sound qualities? Uh, I think you need to experience that. So I think as an industry, that's kind of what we're missing. You know, if we want new converts to being home theater geeks, home theater fanatics, then I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> if we want that, then we need to come up with a way to let people experience it. You know, if you go back, way back to you know the 1970s uh, when there was a huge uh, home stereo boom, right? I mean, it seemed like everybody and their brother and actually everybody and their parents were buying home stereos. You'd have two or three of them in the home, you know, in bedrooms and in the main rooms. And um, a lot of that was a kind of experience at, you know, kind of parties. You'd go to your neighbor's house and they'd have a new stereo set up. And the next thing you know, somebody would be going down to the local hi-fi store and listening to speakers and listening to tuners and going from there. Uh, but we need to have that in the industry today to really you know, get more people involved in it and get more people interested in it. I couldn't agree more. I know that Best Buy still has Magnolia, yes. which in, in some stores provides you with a bit a bit of a better <clears throat> acoustical environment and more of a natural home type of environment in which to audition products. I don't know really of, of any others. I mean, the mom and pop, the small hi-fi shops are, are all disappearing. Yeah, the, the small hi-fi shops are, you know, you kind of have, from a hi-fi perspective, it seems like you have one in every kind of big market or maybe two if two or three if you're in New York City. But other than that, not very many. There's still places where you can get a good demo uh, from sort of a, you know, a local uh, retailer. But you're right, they're, they're disappearing. And it's a sad state yep. of affairs, I should say. Well, listen, um, sorry to end on a sad note, but uh, we've <laughs> had a fascinating hour here talking about Yamaha and its 125-year anniversary and all of the milestones that have occurred uh, for the company and all the uh, innovative products that have come out uh, in all that time. And uh, your knowledge of all of that is truly astronomical. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. My pleasure. That's Tom Sumner, the senior vice president, uh, a senior vice president at Yamaha Corporation of America. And uh, I do thank him for being there. Of course, you can always go look at Yamaha products at usa.yamaha.com, uh, which is their, their U.S. website, obviously. Uh, you can also email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can read my answers to reader and listener questions at hometheaterhifi.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at HT Geek Scott. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Ralph Potts, the Blu-ray reviewer at AVS Forum. We're going to be talking about how he approaches the process of reviewing Blu-rays and what are his favorite discs. And we're talking about the quality of the disc of the Blu-ray here, not necessarily the quality of the movie. There are certainly a number of really stinker movies that uh, nevertheless look really great or sound really great on Blu-ray and are worthy of having in your collection, if only to show off how great your home theater can look and sound. So I do hope you will join me for that. Until then, geek out.